Members, we're ready to roll. Can I welcome you to the Economic and Community Development Committee meeting of the 17th of May? We begin by acknowledging, um, we begin with the acknowledgement of country. The Economic and Community Development Committee acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship with the land. We acknowledge they are continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We have any apologies? Uh, so we have Councillor Brown's going to be late, but it's not an apology. So we have uh, no apologies and no leave of absence. Can I have someone move confirmation of the minutes, please? Moved by uh, Councillor Abiad, seconded by uh, Councillor Corbell. And um, can I put those, all those in favour? That's carried. We have no public forum, no chair's verbal report, so I'll move to items for adoption on the blog. Item 7 is a, um, uh, a workshop, so we're pulling that out. Item 8, Adelaide Parkland Event Management Plan. Anyone want that pulled out? No? Item 9, um, out of, uh, there's no item 9. Item 10, out of session information papers to note a notice of engagement and research activities May two, 2016. Okay, so can I have someone move items 8 and 10, please? Moved by Councillor Milani, seconded by <coughs> Councillor Slama. Um, can I put those items, all those in favour? They are carried. Thank you, members. That takes us back to item uh, 7, which is a workshop on the visitor tourism and visitor services action plan. Um, as you uh, <coughs> got an email from me late last night or early this morning, we're going to turn this into a workshop, so we're not going to be addressing the recommendation. That's to give us an opportunity to have some input into the plan before um, and, and for that input to be taken on board by our administration before we finally look at it to see whether we want to adopt it and if so, in what shape. So I'm going to pass, I think, to Sean McNamara, who will introduce. We're also having we have a short presentation from um, Adam Stanford from the SATC. Um, so welcome and thank you. Um, so um, I'll pass to Adam uh, to Sean, who can do the introductions, and um, and then we'll seek your feedback. Thank you, and through you, uh, Chair. So we do have a small slide deck to uh, take you through this evening. We thought it was really important to. Um, provide a quick overview on how the Tourism and Visitor Services Action Plan uh, has come about and how it's been developed, uh, and just to remind you of the background and how it's aligned to the draft strategic plan as well. I'm going to hand over um, shortly to Naomi, uh, who will talk us through the steps that have been taken so far. Uh, and also, as, uh, as the Chair said, we have Adam Stanford with us, who's the Manager of Strategy and Insights uh, at SATC. So he'll talk to SATC's role, their remit, and the, um, uh, the key focus areas as well. Um, just by way of background, it's really important to note that the action plan works in parallel with the state tourism plan and council's new strategic plan, uh, as well as a number of other key bodies of work underway, such as um, Smart City, our carbon neutral strategy, uh, and the live music initiatives, just to name a few. So it focuses in on the actions that will enhance the tourism uh, industry and improve the overall visitor uh, experience and we've tried to be as succinct as we as we possibly can so that um, we focus our attention where it matters most. Uh, but with that I'll, I'll hand over to Naomi. Great, so um, through the chair, if we just jump to slide four, I think which one's just captured that one. Yeah, so just to bring you back to the original motion, so in October Councillor Clarahan um, raised a motion to call for the development of a tourism action plan, um, outlining opportunities for, to work with key partners and um, bring back a report on the recommended actions, the approach, budget and resource communication for proposed timing. So, um, uh, yep, next. Beautiful. So um, parallel to that, there was, I guess, an existing need for um, a bit of a focus in this area. The state government has set a goal to create an $8 billion industry by 2020, and Adam will talk a little bit more to this. Um, as you're aware, there's already um, some key targets in the new strategic plan around growing international and domestic business nights, um, and also increasing the number of people turning up in some activities. So, 
Um, as with all action plans, I guess the, the benefit of doing this is we will be able to prioritise key actions, improve delivery of our existing visitor services, identify partners and keep us on track to make, make sure we meet, meet future trends. So, um, the action type you know, provides us with an, an overarching guide to work with partners to support the local tourism industry, increase the number of tourists to Adelaide, and in, um, enhance our overall visitor, visitor experience throughout the year. Um, it's predominantly focused, as Sean was mentioning, on the experience of international, interstate and intrastate tourists. When we um, started this piece of work, we had a conversation around you know, is this a, a tourist plan? Is it a visitor plan? We would purposely focus in on the international, interstate, and interstate tourists. Having said that, though, it will um, also have long effects and reap, reap benefits for, for locals who live in Greater Adelaide. Um, but yeah, we really wanted to focus in on the tourism side of things here. It's designed to be flexible and be able to adapt to trends. So some of the key actions have been purposely written or stylized in a way that are high level. Um, for example, packaging up experiences or um, really focusing on um, Adelaide's unique offering. And then underneath that, there is the ability to really hone in on things like the live music or heritage or ecotourism. So um, in, in all, in all um, intents and purposes, it's supposed to just give us a, a, real, a guided action plan and then we can um, adapt that detail as we go along. Um, the roles and remit. So this is, um, I'll hand over to Adam in a second, but a big part of the engagement process was looking at um, the role of state government, SATC, local government, um, and also industry. So really high level, SATC is ultimately responsible for driving demand, in bringing people here. Um, the local government is where we step in and is responsible for providing visitor information once they're here and ensuring it's a supreme visitor experience. Then the industry um, is obviously responsible for providing and improving the quality of the tourist experiences. So I'll hand over to Adam to get to the next slide. Uh, fantastic. Uh, so through the chair, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to, uh, to address uh, here and uh, thanks to the, the council for their engagement with the South Australian Tourism Commission uh, through the development of this plan. Um, as Naomi mentioned, uh, the South Australian Tourism Commission in consultation with the broader industry developed an, an $8 billion uh, uh, potential um, uh, expenditure th uh, throughout uh, South Australia by 2020 and uh, that ambition is reflected uh, to, my, uh, to my understanding through this plan. Currently, there is uh, $5.6 billion of tourism expenditure in South Australia, and $3 billion of that occurs in Adelaide. Um, and there's a few figures here on this on this chart that just highlights the uh, the key role of the tourism industry and the uh, and the, the tangible impact that it does have. Uh, this is at the Adelaide metropolitan region rather than the, uh, the CBD. Uh, so there's 2.7 million overnight visitors. Um, a, a large proportion of those are interstate. Uh, we also get 13% uh, of those being international overnight visitors. Uh, 20,000 jobs are, are, are directly in the tourism industry in the Adelaide metropolitan area, and a large proportion of those would be direct jobs within the, uh, the central business district. That's not counting the indirect employment, um, which is another, also in the tens of thousands. Uh, so the, uh, the SATC is, is certainly very, very supportive of that. We'd like to draw the attention to the opportunity in Adelaide over the next couple of years. Uh, Adelaide is certainly <coughs> exceptionally well exposed to the growth areas in, in uh, tourism, particularly international tourism, as uh, Naomi touched on. The Asian growth markets we know by their, um, their level of appeal are city-based markets, uh, generally staying in a city and touring uh, outside to those near areas. Uh, the massive growth in Adelaide Airport and the, uh, and the growth in, um, in aviation capacity is, uh, has been unprecedented over the last couple of years and Qatar Airways has uh, begun flying in the last, uh, only in the last week, which is very, very encouraging. Uh, Naomi did mention about the South Australian Tourism Commission's role in the context of the broader tourism economy and uh, absolutely nailed it when we say the SATC is all about driving demand, uh, direct to consumer marketing and increasing the appeal of South Australia and increasing the awareness of South Australia. Uh, that uh, is actually out highlighted in the uh, South Australian uh, the, uh, Tourism Plan, pages 18 and 19 uh, is uh, set out and that was done through a lot of industry consultation. Uh, so uh, all of the figures that we've discussed here are available on the South Australian Tourism Commission corporate website, should you be uh, interested uh, any further. Great. So we'll just um, 
following on from Adam, yep. we'll just take you through some of the, the processes just to date, so you've got the background to where we're at right now. Um, following that motion, we did a whole range of internal and external um, stakeholder engagement, and I know a couple of you came along to some of those roundtable discussions and the forum that we held. Um, through that process, we really identified um, you know, some of the key priorities that we could focus on. So if we go to the, to the next slide, um, it really was apparent that um, there was a real strong leadership role that Adelaide City Council could be playing um, in terms of working with Metro Councils um, and industry and partners to really put the spotlight on tourism and, and to give it the boost it needs. Um, it's really clear that there is an existing offer um, already. We don't need to create new things or new activities or new attractions. It's already there. It's just about working better together, promoting them, making it easier for people to find out what's on and what there is to do. Um, and I guess particularly um, pertinent to Adelaide City Council's role is the visitor information services that we currently do. So it's enhancing the visitor information centre building up the tours, um, the city guide to the Adelaide Greeters Network. Um, and then obviously there's things like transport um, and um, infrastructure and Wi-Fi and that kind of thing that we um, play a role in advocating and, and supporting. Um, so really high level, four key themes, promoting the Adelaide experience, collaborating, working better together, enhancing that product offering and tourism infrastructure, leading and supporting industry. Um, yeah, if we go to the next slide. And so basically, um, we're, we're up to here. I'm happy to take questions. The next steps would be, um, obviously, there's a recommendation, which I know we will be deferring tonight, but recommendation is um, to include some budget for the next financial year so that we can um, get on and actually start rolling out some of these actions. Um, the plan would be, once it is endorsed, um, the plan would then be to to come back to council on a regular basis and, and to report and keep you updated and, and to give you progress reports. And there are certain actions in here, e.g. enhancing the visitor information centre, that we would purposely come back and, and flesh that out in further detail and give you the opportunity to, to provide further input into. So yeah, happy to take questions. So members, we've got um, opportunities for questions and for comments. So if you want to have a uh, make a contribution to this uh, action plan, then please, now's your opportunity. Councillor Malali, then Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you. I'll just uh, just give some um, feedback to take on board. I um, I think this is this is great and a good good step in the right direction. I'm excited about the the rollout of this plan. A couple of things that jump out for me, and it's not going to be any surprise to anyone when I pick up the measures of success, um, because to me, I would like to see some more tangible numbers we can qualify. Now, I'm not saying that we, as a council, are going to be responsible for increased number of visitors coming in, because that might not necessarily be our role, but I do believe that there are some more tangible measures of success that we can, we can look at. And I guess when it comes to the actions, and I note, um, if you could just go back a slide. Um, we talk about, um, I guess we, we're pushing a smart uh, city agenda. And I think it's a little bit more than, uh, there was something up there about using smart technologies about what's on. I think it's way more than that. I think we need to be, expand our horizons on how we get smart around tourism, the tourism experience. Um, what, what's new? Is, it, is visitor centres current or, or, and the future and really expand our horizons in, in what that's going to, to look like? Um, I also look at 4.9, for example, which says as an action, apply for existing state, government and federal tourism grant funding. I don't see that. I think, that, I think that's an action of what we do to deliver on a, on a strategy. I don't think that is part of the plan itself. I think, I think we need to just look at some of the, the, um, the actions and, and really uh, what the state are doing, what we're doing and what are, that, that to me is just a means to delivering an action. I, I think we need to be a bit bolder in, in that sense. Um, so that's just some current, you know, 
I guess we use a lot of the word enhance, advocate, collaborate. It's a bit like in our strategic plan. I think we ended up creating a code, if I'm correct, about what's, an act, what's our role in council, what is a, a, the government or a third, another, or a third party's role. So I think we could clearly define in this who does what by when, because they all integrate, but I think there's, some, there's a bit of an opportunity to take that methodology we use in our strategic plan into, into this plan. That's just some feedback I've got. Thank you, Councillor Miranda. Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, there's a couple of things to um, The uh, uh, It talks about enhance the visitor information centre. And um, I've spoken with some of the people involved in our visitor information centre. And the thing that needs most enhancing about it is its location, that back street location in, um, in the laneway there is not readily found by, by tourists who struggle to find it. And I think one of the most important things we should be looking at is having that in a better location. I discussed with them the idea that had been flagged with debated about Located in Victoria Square, and all of it would be even worse. It's even further away, and and really near where the um, that end of King William Street, where the opals and diamonds and tax duty free shops are. That's where the tourists are. That's the part of the city, not not around the corner in James Place. And um, the um, one of our big um, Draws is, is our heritage, and we have Edmund Wright House, for example. And at the moment, there's the thing about what the state government puts in, what the council puts in, and I think the council's got a disproportionate amount for lifting. But I think it'd be worth an approach to the state government for them to make Edmund Wright House available, because that is currently being vacant. And it is a magnificent building, and it is right on that stretch of King William Street. And it would showcase the beautiful architecture that we've got, and it's right in the right part of the city where the tourists are. So I would advocate that we um, make an approach about that, it would be a far better location. I wouldn't want to see any more money wasted on the badly located centre that we've got now. It was also proposing to put it in next to the toilet block down the road, and that was met with even worse reception. Um, in terms of where it could go. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to do. The other thing is, have you um, had any liaison with the, um, with the National Trust? We've just, there's a seminar recently and they've done a new online app for self-guided walking tours. So just really quickly, in terms of visiting information centre, the, the planned approach there is to come back later this year and do a workshop with you and really flesh out all the opportunities, the trends, location, those kind of things. So definitely we'll come back to you and explore those options. Um, and regarding the National Trust, yes, we've um, been working with the, the National Trust and the Heritage Council and attended that workshop and um, we'll be working closely with them. <coughs> Lord Mayor and then Councillor Rochelle. Thanks, Chair. Um, I mean, it's clear that the visitor economy matters to our, uh, certainly our commercial ratepayers, probably also to the culture of our city. Um, but there's one area which I think we could leverage upon more with this plan as it sits now. Is that, um, and it, it's almost a captive market, which we haven't really leveraged. Um, it's the 32,000 international students who currently reside in South Australia and come from various markets around the world. And I think we do have a role to play here. Um, one would suggest in the first instance this could be um, Study Adelaide's job, but I think it's also our job that in order for us to more fully, fully articulate in this plan, what is our role in terms of working with those international students? Because of course their families are tourists. And if we were able to uh, influence growth in terms of tourism, because they're already here. I mean, we've already done most of the hard work. So, and we of course know that many of the international students uh, living in South Australia, some of them are from relatively well-heeled families, um, and they come from all over the world. And it's great for internationalising our city, but I'd like to see a specific section in this report that talks to you what actions council could take to work either directly with or through Study Adelaide, uh, or through the universities, or all three, in order to capitalise on a captive market which we have right in front of us today. 
Thank you, Lord Luke. Has one for sure. Um, thank you. And there's a lot of work gone, gone into this. Um, I guess just to take it off there, that is sort of captured a little bit under 2.3, which is to leverage off and then all of, all of those markets. I, I guess given it's an action plan and not a strategy document, a lot of what I see here are strategies, but actually not the action that's going to be taken. So that whole thing in terms of segmenting of the market, um, which is sort of all bundled together, and I understand that you're trying to do a higher thing that you'll get to, but uh, you know we do have captive markets in terms of the football. Um, you know we've got thousands of people now coming into the city over that winter period. That that is a a market we should be capturing almost immediately. Um, certainly with the cultural calendar, that's the same. Certainly with the sporting calendar. Um, so I guess what I, maybe it's just something that sits before this is a bit of that segmentation, a bit of the themes, you know, if you go back to the DNA that sat behind both the state brand and the work that was done here at council for the city brand, um, that, that really clearly called out that DNA, which was food and wine, heritage, cultural events, um, the parklands, you know, so all of those were called out in there. And I think mm -hmm. even if you revisit some of that, that, that DNA was really, really good to see what people thought of Adelaide both here and away. Um, and also a little bit more articulation around what our key opportunities are in just, the, in, again, in those blocks of time, because um, I like the fact that you've blocked the time in terms of the next few years. Um, just a, a little without, I guess my main question was around us taking the lead in forming a tourism alliance for the Adelaide region. Now, I know in this you differentiate between Adelaide being the Adelaide region and the city. I think our primary resources and our, our remit is actually the city of Adelaide as opposed to taking the lead for a regional marketing plan. So I'd like that fleshed out just a little bit because um, that to me is the Tourism, Tourism Commission's responsibility as opposed to the City of Adelaide's responsibility. Certainly I understand the need to network and be aware of what's happening in other regions and that there needs to be some way to facilitate that discussion so we can promote each other and help each other and all that sort of stuff, but not to develop a marketing plan for the Adelaide region, I wouldn't have thought that that was ours. Um, my other query was about giving tourism specific business advice to city based businesses, and I didn't know whether we actually had the uh, proper resources to be able to do that in terms of people with experience in tourism and packaging and how you actually put together that sort of information. Um, in the uh, page 23, which just had the key deliverables per year, um, the one that just stood out for me there was the improved knowledge of the Adelaide Tourism Project uh, pro product amongst concierges, front of house, etc. I believe that could be pulled forward. That could be something that you could do immediately. And at that um, really good planning day that you had at the um, Adelaide Oval, the guy there was the head of the concierge international concierge network that you introduced me to. And so certainly that sort of stuff could be uh, done. Um, going back to very old festival days, the briefing to taxi drivers and the taxi guard was probably the most significant thing that the festivals did in the 90s. And we worked with tourism on that as well. And that they all became ambassadors. That was quite incredible. And it was done over a barbecue. So. Um, Again, just a, a little bit of feedback in terms of detail, um, in terms of our role offering tailored packages. I, I believe that's a, a private enterprise role. And it's also, um, as uh, you'd be well aware, Adam, there's a lot of packaging and itineraries already out there. So I believe our role is to promote as opposed to develop something in competition with those inbound and outbound operators that already have that going. Um, and my last one, because I'm sorry I'm taking too long, is just in terms of Aboriginal content. Um, again, the South Australian Museum probably has one of the best Aboriginal cultures galleries in the country as a starting point. And I would, uh, as much as I, um, I love the work Tandania does, you would be remiss to forget the um, the North Terrace Boulevard, but also what is in the um, uh, museum. And finally, just 3.18, uh, 
uh, in terms of securing a calendar of arts, culture and sporting events. You've got Renewal SA and Arts and Events SA, but you've missed the Office of Rec and Sport and Arts SA, who are the key funders for all of the cultural events. So, and there's others, but they're little, and I'll send them back. So we've got Councillor Corbell and Councillor Slammer both want to make some comments, I think, and then uh, we might wrap this up. I just want to start by saying thank you. Um, I think this is an excellent body of work. There's so much time and effort that's gone into it and lots of contribution from many um, different significant sources. A um, couple of things that I picked up on um, in relation to international students. I work with international students quite a lot in my role at the University of Adelaide and it surprises me um, on many occasions, the events that we hold through the city, the lack of awareness and knowledge that the international students have, especially the Chinese ones, about what's on offer for them. Um, so I think a key way to address that, which isn't necessarily touched on in the, in the plan, is through um, local media like IH Media and WeChat. So their social media platforms and also the student groups working more with the, the international student groups. So the Chinese Students Association, they have um, massive membership numbers and their committee alone is 100. So if you connect really well with them and have a good relationship, then they can promote that and then it increases the awareness, not just working with Study Adelaide. They are also very important to work with. Um, 2.4 talks about industry development and information sharing events. I think um, an emerging market is um, obviously Uber and also the Tree Cycles, EcoCaddy. Um, they play a very important role um, in providing information, especially during our peak festival times. And picking up on the information centre, I'm really very keen to uh, participate in that workshop and provide some contribution around the location. I think the location is the key and the size and promoting that also working closely with the industry, um, the Adelaide Tourism Regional Alliance with the other councils, because Adelaide is a gateway, the city is a gateway. They come into the, people come into the airport, the bus station, they come in by a private motor vehicle. A lot of them end up in the city. That's where a lot of the money's being spent, but we don't have a dedicated information centre really that's serviceable for the city, let alone for the region. So we should be able to provide this centre um, as an information point for all of South Australia. Contributions coming from all of South Australia, information about Holdfast Bay, what's on offer at Grinnell, how to get there, etc. And that, that was a state government role and they actually had one and they closed it. They so had one underground. No, they had one on King Williams Street Williams for many, many years. Oh, well, we need that back. We need like a <laughs> tourism commission. So that's not the city of Adelaide's responsibility. Well, I see us as playing a role in that. Well, we are playing we a role. Have our position. Oh, we have our position. Sure. Sorry. We're working with them to do yeah. the so, information. Yeah, so touching up on what Councillor Wilkinson was suggesting, I think that's very important. That's a start with you. Thank you, Chief. Um, just a quick question, if I can. What consideration have you given in this to the to utilising our, our parking inspectors in their roles, in their roles of being ambassadors and um, taking the message out onto into the streets? Um, so the, one of the key things um, on the action plan is endorsed is a whole um, internal and external engagement process in terms of raising the awareness of what we're trying to do here. So all staff would be engaged, including our parking inspectors um, and any really frontline services and getting um, staff that are out in the public realm, whether it is parking inspectors or people out in the gardens and actually um, underlining their role that they are the front line and, and are presenting the city to visitors and locals alike. Yeah, cool. Um, so no strategy work on that as yet? Not as yet, but um, once the action plan is endorsed, that's definitely something that will be a key focus. Yeah. Didn't you move Thank that though, Dave? Thank you. Why hasn't Council Moran? Um, why, just just why, why hasn't there been any work? I mean, I don't particularly agree with Council Moran. Um, we've got some other people who wish to speak, so oh, right. just, just just you can hold your fire for a moment. If I could just close off with this and feedback from me, back, back to you guys, is to uh, take that on board um, and it's certainly good use of good, good use of our resource, I think. And perhaps that can be incorporated as an action in the action plan. Councillor Clarahan, did you want to just have a really quick question before we move on? Because and then if you did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. I did. Yeah. 
having called for this report, I'd like to say well done. And I also see, I attended a couple of the workshops and the round tables and the representation there was across the board, which gets back to this whole integrated approach. I think we've got to cut through the silo mentality. And I think this is an opportunity for us to have a look at, I mean, exactly how we do work together. Um, I think, you know, if we continue to work in our silos, we're obviously not leveraging um, the opportunities that are there to the way in which we could leverage them. And that includes our role as a capital city and also working with our metropolitan councils and regions. I mean, you know, the whole issue around amalgamation comes up and shared services. And, you know, we do need to look at how we work, not only with our family and local government, but also business and also the tourism mission. Um, I think Councillor Wilkinson's suggestion about the Edmund Wright House is fantastic. And there is the potential there um, to investigate the opportunities for, again, an integrated approach. I take Councillor Vershaw's point about local government not taking on the responsibility of what is government funded roles. I accept that. However, there are ways and means in which we could investigate working together. One of the comments in the uh, about the Visitor Information Centre was around um, not being able to take bookings uh, and how people are there sort of sent on their way to do their own thing. Uh, I think there's a, a whole lot we can do in terms of our service provision to make it a seamless experience. I remember the work also of Charles Landry who says, who said that one of the um, key issues around um, a creative city, um, a livable city was the welcoming city. And I think that, you know, you've, you've identified lots of areas there that we can work on. I mean, the fact that someone came in, I think from a bus tour company uh, to talk to council about how he saw there were, were massive opportunities there for us to provide a better service to tourists and to tell some stories about our, our great city, uh, which then prompted me to raise the issue around the Tourism Action Plan. So, and one more thing was about the international students um, I understand the figures that you showed us, they're included in, are they included in the figures up there in terms, to, are they counted, our international students, as tourists? Uh, yes, absolutely. But uh, there is a difference in the way that the um, uh, Education Adelaide, for instance, counts uh, the, number of, the number of international students. So within that figure, the, the number of international students will be considerably lower because we're only looking for students who stay for less than one year which is how we find oh, things here. Okay. So there is a larger body of yeah. students there and also there's commencements and enrolments and I'm not across the okay. detail of what That's that is. Fine. That's fine, I understand. Uh, and just, yeah, there are opportunities there. I think Councillor Slammer or someone, uh, no, maybe Councillor Corbell raised the issue around how we need to leverage the number of family members who come to this city uh, to visit their to visit their children. And we need to really look at the offering uh, that we can provide prior to them dashing off to the eastern states. I think there's a lot of work to be done there from graduation ceremony, for example. You know, surely we can sort of, you know, jazz it up a bit and, and create quite an event. We're good at events. We're good at arts and culture, the whole bit. Let's build on that too. But thank you. I think this is a, a very thorough, comprehensive plan and great starting place. Thank you, Councillor Perhan, and thank you, uh, members, for the contribution, valuable contributions, I think. I've also got some notes here that most of which, much of which has been picked up by the comments that have been made, but I'm more than happy to make those available to you. Um, thank you very much for the staff members who've been, the staff members who've been involved in pulling that together, and we look forward to seeing what comes back. Thank you very much for yeah, making yeah, yeah. the time. That's all right. You missed it. Oh, well, I did. That's all right. We have, yeah. Respect please, you. please um, feel free to make some contribution. Directly, I beg your pardon, councillors. But we do need to move on because we've been on that uh, agenda item for quite some time. So that brings us now to agenda item 11, other business. Does anybody have? Hang on, uh, Chair, it's a combined workshop plus a series of four recommendations. No, we've um, 
Uh, Councillor, I sent an email around uh, earlier, late last night or early this morning, to indicate that we're not going to adopt the recommendation tonight. We just um, change this into a workshop. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't receive yeah, that. Yes. Yeah. 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 So um, that's going to come, that was to allow us to. to uh, put forward as our in contribution to the plan and give the give the staff the opportunity to go away and incorporate some of our our thinking into the plan. Oh, and that will come back I to us shortly. I haven't received either, so I wonder if we're to check on your email list. Yeah, text message actually, I think. I didn't receive it. I didn't receive it. Oh, my apologies. My apologies. I got lots, of, I did get some responses back, so it clearly went out to a number of people, but my apologies if it didn't reach you. Text um, uh, so that does bring us to item um, 11, which is other business. Does anybody have any other business? Uh, Lord Mayor. Chair, can I move a motion without notice, please? Uh, members, I'm hoping this was distributed uh, fairly late in the piece. It's a motion without notice with regards to uh, transmission of internet and data speeds in the City of Adelaide. Members, has everybody received or would you care for me to read it? Yes, please. please read it. Moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Abbey. Thank you, Councillor. I'll read the uh, motion to you, Members. The Council request administration to provide a report by September 2016 on the potential benefits, risks and opportunities of a 10 gigabit per second capable fibre optic network in the City of Adelaide to support the delivery of the smart city objectives within Council's strategic plan. This report contains, amongst other things, case studies, partnership alternatives, delivery models and further information as deemed relevant. Members, I will talk to this. Um, uh, as Councillor Malani spoke to earlier in the, in the uh, previous uh, agenda item, but with regards to our focus on being a smart city. I've got a second to Councillor with uh, Councillor Abia, I believe. Oh. Is that correct, Chair? Yes, oh, I do. Okay. Um, I'll take a third. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we have four key areas of focus members under our strategic plan, which of course is smart, livable, green and creative. And the smart city agenda seems to pervade much of what we do because technology pervades everything we do uh, in this day and age. But members, I urge you to think about what are the key industries, the key sectors, which certainly the growth sectors in the city of Adelaide that are no particular order, uh, medical, education, financial services, professional services, the creative industries, tourism, of course, as aforementioned. But what we do know is that knowledge industries are really important to our city. And in the last three years, we've seen actually employment growth of some 14% in terms of knowledge workers across the city of Adelaide. So it's quite clearly uh, knowledge is an incredibly important sector and a growing sector and uh, data and information and the fast transmission of it, you can see the relationship. So there's also a parallel discussion, of course, locally and nationally about innovation and what that means and what that means to uh, business attraction, uh, head offices, residential attraction, a whole range of things. Um, we've been, I would suggest, a fairly infrastructure-based uh, council chair, um, but we've had a real focus on ensuring that we've got good infrastructure within the City of Adelaide, whether that be our roads or our footpaths or our street lighting or our smart city, smart city technology, which is attached to our street lighting. Um, I'd encourage you to think about data, uh, internet, uh, transmission of data and the speed of it as actually an infrastructure discussion. It could be the most transformational piece of uh, infrastructure, infrastructure that we have. We speak about entrepreneurs, we speak about our Adelaide free Wi-Fi. So this all seems to be kind of making a bit of sense. However, let's look at one thing which Adelaide has always lacked members and the ability to really cut through and attract head offices, bigger ones to the city of Adelaide, to South Australia. Maybe if we had super fast internet, that could be the defining moment in terms of attracting kind of business from nationally and internationally to Adelaide and truly turning it into an entrepreneurial hub. Um, that could be, no other city seems to be doing this. We've got our NBN rolling out over the next 12 months, we know that. That's going to give us up to a, that's going to give us certainly a measurable increase upon what we've got now. But the opportunity is way above that. There is a growing number of cities, some coming out of the US, who have done this. And this is why I've asked for case studies in this report to really look at how they did it and what the results of doing it. And what that means to business attraction and investment attraction, and residential attraction and a whole range of things. So members, um, I do hope, I'm asking for a report. I'm giving administration three or four months to, to do this. 
Uh, I think it's a really important conversation. I must say I had a discussion some time ago. We were talking about various other matters, but with the Premier, and the Premier was saying, how can we position Adelaide as a city where people test stuff? They do things first. So I've kind of got me thinking, I'm thinking, well, if we had super fast internet, maybe that is the ultimate enabler of testing things first in Adelaide. Maybe that's the thing that gets the cut through on the, on the, nat on the global stage. I don't think this is just a national opportunity. I think this is actually truly a global one. However, I'm not a technology expert. Um, I just believe this could be a really good opportunity for us to explore, and I'd like administration to do us uh, a prepare a report over the next three or months, three or four months, so they can help educate us about what this opportunity really looks like. So I just encourage you to support this motion. Thanks, members. Thank you. Councillor Abbey. Was that my right at those things? Councillor Slama, then Councillor Clarence. Um, sorry, my hand went up just to register another motion after his, but I'll, I'll talk to that anyway, just to, in support, Lord Mayor. I think I think this is great. And um, I want to just talk to the economic development piece of, of this and results out of the last Shandong mission. I'll bring it up now because there is one company that is looking at setting up their Australasian headquarters in Adelaide. Um, we had a meeting a briefing this morning with the LGA and it's, it's a live one and this is a critical um, requirement for them that they're looking for. Um, so that's just one example that I can use straight away. Tell us who it is. Um, just to say that I totally support this uh, report coming back. There are huge implications for us as a city, a smart city and a city that attracts businesses uh, and also young entrepreneurs. Um, and there are, we know of companies that do, um, although they're working, over, working with major companies overseas, choose to remain in Adelaide because of the lifestyle. And I think that there are a lot more people who would choose to live in Adelaide um, if they believe that they could conduct their business uh, in a way that they need to. And that is through obviously fast um, and internet capacity and speed. So um, I totally support this, this report coming back to council. And at least, I mean, who knows what it would cost, but who knows who the partners could be and where we may in fact get support from various levels of government to, to even implement it. Um, yeah, apart from the, the business advantage and attracting business uh, within the CBD, there was recent stuff I was reading about how people were following, you know, with where the rollout of NBN was happening and it was actually affecting demand. People were choosing where they want to buy the residential regard in terms of where they're going to get high speed internet. So you know, certainly we're pushing for people want to want to live in the city. So this is another potential attractive for people to live in the city because you'll get the best possible uh, internet service if you're living in the city as well as being able to walk everywhere. Councillor Martin. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, look, uh, I will support this. Uh, it's pretty hard to argue against the principle, but I would ask the administration in the process of conducting the investigation to consider another option, and that is whether, in fact, there is a role for council in this process. There is you know, an argument that, that the provision of high-speed internet services um, belongs correctly in the private sector. Uh, and it may well be that the best thing we can do is encourage the private sector to get on with it. And so I'd like uh, the administration to take that on board and consider that uh, there may be a role for council that is not as active as is proposed. Councillor you've reserved your right to speak? Yeah, just briefly. Um, Look, I, I see exactly what the uh, Lord Mayor is proposing and it's a very clear agenda and it's something I'm prepared to support, but also with what uh, Councillor Martin said in relation to the role of government. One of the things I've been thinking about since this was proposed uh, a few weeks ago and it's been in discussion in relation to high-speed internet, look, it might not be our role today, but I can't imagine a city of the future from an infrastructure perspective that's not going to be looking at the importance of the digital economy and the digital sector. So. I don't know if it's something we pick up in the future. I mean, look, you know, you can't imagine if we had no roads and no rail and no buses, people don't come in our cities. And just like if we don't have the infrastructure for the internet, potentially we might not be able to attract those digital businesses, entrepreneurs, 
and even larger corporations to come to our city. So potentially this may be a core cool business of the council of the future or even the council of today. I, mean, I don't know. Uh, I do have a question mark on it, but potentially if it becomes a service to our ratepayers and something we need to invest in in the way of infrastructure or partner with uh, with a private uh, a private a private firm, uh, then so be it. But uh, look, I really look forward to understanding a little bit more about how other cities around the world have managed to roll it out um, and uh, in what capacity were they involved in a way of partnership or more. Uh, but uh, look, it's definitely an exciting, uh, an exciting thing to discuss. And I think, to be honest with you, all our services, if we want to be uh, more efficient, even as a council in the future, we're going to have to have a lot of reliance on this actual network itself for our own services. I mean, take the businesses out and everything else out. Uh, if we want to be more connected and more efficient in our own services, connecting to our garbage bins, trees, bands, digital stuff, everything we need to do. We're going to need to have uh, a solid infrastructure set up in place to support our own uh, our own demand. So it will be an interesting piece of work and I look forward to uh, reading it in detail, uh, hopefully in the next couple of months. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'll sum up briefly. Um, I think this is one of these opportunities also whereby uh, our size becomes our strength in terms of the city. Uh, the, so I, I do look forward to this report and thank you members for speaking to it favourably and I, I do take on board Councillor Martin and Councillor Abiyad's views with regards to uh, whether this could be principally delivered by the private sector. Maybe it could be and that's, this is why I'm also asking for the report so that uh, we can articulate what that looks like. Uh, we've got a very skilled uh, ICT team here at Adelaide City Council and I think this is just a massive opportunity. The <coughs> Also, the kind of the exponential growth of the Internet of Things. Um, we don't even know where this is going to go, but what we do know is we're going to need pretty good infrastructure in order to accommodate it. Um, also, for the growth of the creative industries, uh, in uh, everything from <coughs> filmmakers to you name it, uh, we'll rely on super fast internet. And also, of course, the medical industries. Medical imaging uh, is, you know, it's, it's such a huge growth area. There's such investment in physical infrastructure in our city in terms of the medical um, uh, sector in the city of Adelaide. It's concentrating in the city of Adelaide. It's having this as an enabler for um, transmission of uh, fast data is critical. So this role, I think, this report will answer all these questions uh, in terms of what is our role, what does best case look like, what are the benefits, uh, who are the potential partners? How should it be delivered? When will it be delivered? So, uh, members, I commend this to you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I put that, please? All those in favour? All those against? That's carried. Um, Councillor Simon's indicated he's got a motion without notice, another motion without notice, but before we get to that, I wonder if um, I can get someone to move that we adjourn this meeting. So moved by Councillor um, uh, Milani and seconded by Councillor Slava. All those in favour of adjourning this meeting? That's carried and I hand over to Councillor Abia to open this meeting. I declare the Finance and Business Services Committee meeting for 17th of May uh, open at 6.24pm uh, and I seek someone to adjourn. Moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Slama. All those in favour? All those against? The meeting's adjourned. Which allows me to reopen my meeting. Thank you, Councillor Abiyad. And uh, move to Councillor Slama. I think he has a, has indicated oh. he's got a motion without notice. Thank you, Chair. Um, do, do members have a copy of this motion without notice? Yep. It's, uh, oh, there it is on, on, the, on the thing. Um, do I need to read it out or can I can just move? Can I see a seconder? Second for Councillor Thank you, Councillor. Members, um, you might think why. And firstly, I want, I want to apologise for bringing it to you without notice and I have a reason for that. Um, I must say it's my first motion without notice in my history in council, so, so I can't now say on the record I'm not giving you enough notice. Um, the month of April for me was overseas and coming back to um, the project that's developing in our sister city and also in relation to our 30 anniversary celebration and 15 year friendship relationship with uh, Chindao. The development of the um, Royal Adelaide Club 
project in China is um, going ahead a million miles an hour. And they, they've come back to um, and in current conversations with the Fringe and other sponsors and saying, look, can we, um, can we look at um, increasing what, what um, current contributions um, are happening and looking at maybe, maybe are we looking at um, how the Fringe can help some of these artists go over to China for these projects. Um, now, this motion asks for 60 grand. Um, item number six, um, $60,000, and I want to put it into perspective, into perspective as to why. Um, the, the pure goal in doing all this is to drive the economic development and drive job growth in this city. You might ask, how does that relate to what the Fringe does? But what, what the Fringe is doing is enabling artists to go over there. We're enabling not only them to perform what they're doing, but we're advertising what's happening in our city. We're advertising our events, and um, this is this is a, a key key factor to consider, because one of the developments out of the last mission has been the southern um, China Southern Airlines coming and flying directly into Adelaide. That will bring approximately twenty thousand new visitors to this city, and I want to dress it up in that context, that whatever it is that we're doing, the money that we're spending, allowing the fringe to operate, to send artists over there, to market the brand, to market the city in our sister city under our, under our anniversary um, opportunity that we have at the moment, will inevitably grow, inevitably grow those numbers of people coming to the city. Economic developments in relation to people in the city will put bums in chairs on restaurants, will fill hotel rooms, We'll, we know that we know full well that if the commercial sector in this city is alive, is kicking, is growing, that enables a lot of things to happen. In fact, that could even allow, uh, enable residential rate pays to have to have to have some, uh, you know, a rebate, not a rebate, um, um, an explanation on, on what what it is that we're doing here. Um, so in that context, um, I want to put that motion to you. Um, the third thing there that I forgot to mention is that the the invitation for the Qingdao Beer Festival to come to Adelaide is alive and has been presented and is currently being discussed. So the beer festival at the moment is, yes, it is a beer festival. The Royal Adelaide Club has have, um, changed what the beer festival is. They've added a cultural, uh, sorry, a trade um, and economic platform to that festival. So it's enabling our businesses to go over there and ex and demonstrate and um, put on display what products and what services they have on offer. Um, moving back to the festival coming here, so 2017 seeks a reciprocal event of the Qingdao Beer Festival coming to Adelaide. Um, part of what we're doing with the Fringe and when, I must say when, uh, two months ago, when the Fringe actually came here to Adelaide, sorry, when, so not the French, when um, the Chinese counterparts came to Adelaide to look at the French. Um, they, they got it and they want more of what they seen at the Garden, at the Croquet Club and at the at Gluttony and all the other events. So they've come back to us and said, how can we get more of those events happening at this particular festival? This motion, this 60 grand will enable the French to respond and activate some of those artists to go back and put that put that put that show on for them. Um, so that's pretty well it from me. Um, I want to put it to the floor. Uh, I asking for in point six that council has a look at um, the 60k. I haven't made specific which budget allocation it comes out of, um, but I might seek some um, advice from from council in that process. All I want to do is get a surety. And I want to firm up um, to the French that this um, level of activity or this level of funding may be available to them, may be available so that they can plan with the festival being two and a half months away. Uh, not a, lot, a long time to go and that's why I'm moving it without notice. I'm taking on board too that um, we're deliberating the French grant um, or sponsorship in, in June. And so I wanted to move this separate from that because uh, it has a separate purpose. 
um, and generally too late to make to let the fringe make a decision on who they could support in going over there anyway. Um, thank you. Councillor Corbell, you second. Thank you. Yes, I'm very happy to second this and thank you to Councillor Simon for putting it forward. Um, I visited Qingdao for the first time earlier this year as part of the state delegation representing Council. And um, this Qingdao Beer Festival is a significant festival for China. From our um, Tourism and Visitor Services Action Plan, it's very clear, the information is very, very clear. It's been provided to us. The Chinese are visiting South Australia and spending last, they spent $171 million on the economy overall with an average spend per visitor of 5,300 plus. $60,000 is a drop in the ocean. That 5 million comes from across China and it's also a global audience. So if we're investing a small amount into the Fringe Festival, it becomes a platform of the best of what South Australia has to offer. A cultural platform which can then be used as, a, as an opportunity to exchange information about our education services, our, our top food, our wine, our cheese, our export offerings. I see this as a small investment with great gain, great potential for gain. I see it as a strategic investment and I seek everybody supporting this. Councillor Anton. Uh, looks kind of stagey first by start by asking a question of administration. Do, are we aware of whether any funding has been received um, from council or from the state government for this venue in the Qingdao Beer Festival? Um, to, to date? Has there, is there any funding of, that's been given? I think Carly Renis is to that Thank you. Uh, so through the Chair, yes, uh, funding has been provided by the State Government. Um, in terms of the quantum of that, uh, I'm, I would need to check whether that's commercial in confidence or not, but there has been funding provided. So, Sorry, just the other question was whether it's all from council, nothing from council. Uh, through the chair, no. Uh, so today there's been no funding provided to the Royal Adelaide Club. There has certainly been uh, in-kind support um, provided. So Councillor Slama, uh, on behalf of council, led a delegation in January and there was uh, support provided on the ground uh, and some translation support, but no financial support. Okay, um, well look, I, I have to, um, so I'm, I'm speaking against this motion. I, I, look, I, I know it's well intentioned, but I think um, the, the issue is that we are, by supporting this, we, we are effectively uh, giving ratepayers money to um, provide performance for a private enterprise in, uh, uh, in, 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 albeit in a different guise and potentially with some, some potential tourism uh, benefits. But at the end of the day, um, this comes back to something which I seem to be constantly um, uh, saying, which is I really don't think this is our job. I mean, I, I uh, correct. And at the end of the day, I, I really do. I mean, I, I don't think in one sense this is any different to us um, sending a group of accountants to perhaps the US for a conference. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't mean to be unkind about it. I think it's quite well intentioned, but I really don't see that as being a great selling point for um, the ratepayers of our, of our um, of our uh, city, so I, I really, I, I just, I'm not quite sure why it is that that this would be something we would we would turn our mind to. I, at the end of the day, I would have thought if we've got performers that need to go to uh, a venue like this, then I would have thought uh, having uh, money from the state government uh, would be a good headway into providing those performers. And I would have thought that if it's um, if it's something which which is really that important to the venue, it could be done through that funding. So I, I'm sorry, I speak against this one. Councillor Moran, then Councillor Bishop. I'd just like to ask, what, um, I consider this the motion ultra-virus, it's a motion without notice, involving direct financial um, contribution to the council. Now our protocol has been, I'm the only person here that remembers that, that we don't deal with money motions um, on, without being on notice. So we get a staff report. I will be voting against this tonight. Um, Councillor Moran, can I just get an answer that, on that question well, first? I'll get the answer to it's not good practice, it's not good practice. Well, no, I'd like to refuse. If I can confirm for members, it certainly was a considered practice on previous uh, councils. It did, however, not make it into standing orders in terms of policy because it would breach the ability of members to place matters on notice or the ability to raise a matter without notice. 
Look, I, um, I think it was good practice, and I think we should have adhered to that. Um, a motion that I'd accept tonight was that um, that this be put on, on, on notice and discussed at the next meeting, allowing then the staff to quantify the, um, the amount needed, also to contact the fringe. Have, have, have we, there's no input here, have they asked for this money or just the three chats that run the, the Royal um, Croquet Club, now the Royal Adelaide Club, which seems to be cheeky. Um, uh, I'm sure the uh, Royal Adelaide Club themselves would be, um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, so we've got no information. We don't know how much the state government's giving. We don't know whether it's actually been a request, um, how, how this has been given to us. We don't know why $60,000. Um, I'm afraid I totally agree with the councillor Antic. This is not a core business. This, the Royal Croquet Club is a private business. Um, we already give generously to the fringe. And um, if the state government want to help, that's fine. If the arts community want to help, but I do not see it as our role. But I also urge you to not vote for this tonight because there is no information. What, what does the 60 go to? If we went out to our break cards and we send 60 grand to a private company so they could go to China, I mean, why? What, what do they benefit do they get? Okay, we've got some um, lovely things like the airline coming here. We don't know whether that's directly linked to what they might have been coming here. There's just not enough information. If you want to do it properly, I suggest the mover leaves, leaves this motion and resubmits it as a motion on notice, allowing the staff to give a proper report. Then I might vote for it. I doubt it. But I'm, I'm definitely not voting for it in its form. I mean, as uh, somebody said, it's like sending a, a group of accountants overseas. We probably would, and we'd send half the council with them. We've got to stop doing this rubbish. Not, not that this is rubbish, but it's rubbish for us to be doing it. Councillor Vershaw, then Councillor Malani. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, it had scrolled down, so I just wanted to check that it was for South Australian artists. Um, the other thing, if I can ask administration, um, rather than this than being a consideration for the 16-17 budget, could it be looked at as part of the uh, Q3 budget reconsiderations? Um, through the chair, um, yes, it could be. Um, this Q3 is being considered tonight um, by the committee. Um, the issue with that from um, setting up precedent in the process um, was the advice that I actually gave to councillor was in relation to putting an item into the budget as part of the Q3 and that knowing that was immediately going to be a carry forward item into the new year. In essence, this was actually a budget item for consideration to a new year budget. Thank you. That's it, councillor Vishal. Did you wish to make any comments? So councillor Malani, then councillor Martin. Thank you. Look, I have to um, agree that personally, myself, I have a principle of not doing motions without notice that have financial implication um, for a budget. So, on the budget. So, therefore, uh, if the if the move is not uh, going to um, withdraw this and take it to council, I would like to move an, an amendment as move an amendment because, to be honest, this has to go to council anyway as a recommendation from this committee. So the timing is going to be exactly the same. So so I'll I'll happy to put a, some words together if that's if if we're going down this pathway. I'm looking for the mover to say that he's gonna withdraw it and take it to council. Or am I going with an amendment? Can we just um so I'm happy to go in the amendment path if we want to. No. So there, are, there are two options here, um, Councillor Summer. You can seek the uh, indulgence of the chamber to vary your motion to seek to withdraw it, and then, um, and then put it to uh, to council, or we can allow the amendment. Either of them, I think, can, they both achieve the same outcome. Can, can I just say, I would also perhaps, um, can I just say that just uh, if the movie is going to do that, or with some comments I've got here. There's some, there's very much some wording in this motion that I, I don't support either. So we, yeah. If you want to, so, um, oh, can we just give Councillor Sam an opportunity to respond to that? Um, I, I get the vibe in the room. Um, let, let's say to Council next week. Okay, so, so I'll withdraw. You seek to vary. I'll seek, I'll seek to. And what, what will we need to do? 
So just withdraw. Okay. So you seek to very to withdraw it, and as long as the seconder, Councillor Corbell, with, agrees with that, then it is withdrawn, and it can be resubmitted as a motion on notice for council, and perhaps. And there might be an opportunity to talk to Councillor Milani and some other councillors um, about the actual wording that might have done some more support. So um, that, the Councillor Summer sought that variation. Can I just seek the um, mood of the meeting? Are we all happy to allow that variation? All those who are in favour of that, that, that variation is allowed. Okay, thank you members. So that, that's productive and, and we might get there some by another methodology. Councillor Abiat. Questions? Motion. I, uh, um, Madam Chair, I'd just like to move a motion without notice. Um, unlike the ones before, this was uh, brought to council attention on a few times. Just to uh, briefly read it, that council, one notes the previous council decision on this matter, two, it considers the removal of all annual outdoor dining fees for the city hospitality and businesses as part of its current budget considerations. Can I seek a seconder? Seconder. So just speaking briefly to this, um, in uh, in January, December, January um, of uh, 2014, this motion was moved. Um, it was then brought again to council's attention and endorsed by council to be part of this budget process in, um, I believe, uh, in late last year. Um, uh, it's come to my attention in looking at the budget process that it's not currently in the budget process as part of the council decision uh, as part of December last year. Uh, so look, I think it's crucial that we give this consideration as it is, uh, it is a council decision. It is important that we look at it uh, as part of this budget consideration. There's been a promise, there's been a goodwill to the community that we consider this. We have made it clear. Uh, it's been endorsed by council um, and it's yet not part of this process or this budget process to date. So uh, this is just to reinstate I guess the will of the council and to bring about the decision again um, to uh, to bring that as being part of the uh, part of the budget process. Now I'm uh, happy to keep it there. I think it's just uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, I think administration want to make some comments on this. So can I, Mark, did you wish to make a response to, to give us some information about this? Thanks, Chair. Um, the uh, in, our, in our draft papers that we brought through to. Uh, a CO workshop on the 13th of April. Uh, we had actually removed those uh, outdoor dining fees. It was the uh, the desire of the uh, the members present at that meeting that those outdoor dining fees go back into the budget, and that's why the draft budget, uh, as endorsed by council a couple of weeks ago last week, uh, a couple of weeks sorry sorry, um, did not include did not include a, a reduction of the outdoor dining fees. Just can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so just that desire, is that was that a motion passed? Because I'm not across it. Through the chair, it was uh, not a motion, it was a CO workshop. Yep. Um, and we had noted in the council report that we brought through for the draft budget for consultation, the uh, the, uh, the feedback that we'd received through those workshops and through, through the special committee meetings. Um, and that was certainly one of those uh, pieces of feedback that we got. Pretty loud and clear, I should say. You may have been away for that, Sorry? You may have been away for that, Yeah, I was away for the workshop, but nevertheless, it's a CEO briefing. It's not a council decision. Um, the council decision that has currently is currently on the books is for us to consider uh, to removal of outdoor dining fees. You should have put it back in there. I'm doing it now. I can. We have a council decision. Uh, we have a council decision on this matter. The last that this was looked at was in the CEO briefing, where the feel of the room was felt. There wasn't a decision. There wasn't a motion as per se. So I'm just putting this back in for consideration at this stage to go out to public consultation as part of the process. Councillor Malani, a seconder. Where is that, my right? Councillor Martin, then Councillor Wilkinson, then Councillor Wren. Can I just uh, clarify with the administration? <laughs> we have voted on the budget. That is, the document is complete for public consultation. It has gone out for public consultation. Therefore, there has been a vote by Council not to include the outdoor dining fee proposal that Councillor Abiad is proposing. Is that correct? Uh, through the Chair, 
the, the, the vote was for the draft budget in its entirety. Uh, it, it didn't specifically call out a recommendation not to, uh, to, to reduce the outdoor dining fees, but it was for the budget in total, which included outdoor dining fees in its revenues. Like that, so uh, there have been opportunities prior to tonight to insert that and it hasn't been inserted and I just remind members that we have been through a process and those of us who attended the budget deliberations spent hours and hours debating these matters and specifically this proposal. It came to us as a uh, an inclusion in the budget bottom line and in the midst of a debate about slashing expenditure on a range of initiatives, it was decided that the $400,000 approximately involved in this initiative was too great a cost to bear, not least because the costs of administering the outdoor dining scheme are $400,000 and they remain. So revenue $400,000 lost, costs $400,000 remain. That was the decision that uh, that swayed everybody, or the argument that swayed everybody. And so it was withdrawn and it came through council in a, a process on which everybody voted. It has now gone out to consultation. Now, I, I am aware that there are these proposals that keep coming back about them, like stray dogs. They just keep hanging around. And I just wish that we could get on with the process of standing by the budget we've got. But let me, let me address the issue here because it has been discussed previously and, and I think it's worth reminding everybody that the logic of this proposal is not straightforward. In fact, it's confused. It is and has been sold to us as an incentive uh, to the hospitality industry. But in the hospitality industry, these outdoor dining facilities are functioning, are costed into the operations of businesses and will remain. There is no incentive. It is simply a cash handout to ratepayers, to business ratepayers. Now, whether they need it or not, this is how we're going to give them a few dollars. If this was a genuine proposal related to an incentive to outdoor dining, then it would be about an exemption for new or uh, existing businesses ex expanding their facilities rather than just a cash handout. Moreover, if we were smart about it, we'd be offering an incentive to outdoor dining facility operators to upgrade the offering. Then it would be a legitimate thing to provide the incentive. In this case, it is nothing more than a cash handout. And, and on that basis alone, and particularly given we've just listened to so many members say that we have a, uh, if not a policy, then a practice in this place not to deal with money bills as they come to us without any notice. And I remind everybody that the email for this came round as we began to meet in here for a briefing at five o'clock. At 16.59, there is the proposal to spend $400,000. Now, if that principle stands, if everyone was so concerned about Councillor Slama's $60,000, being a matter that needed to be properly considered with the advice of administration, then how is it it's possible to approve a $400,000 expenditure in similar circumstances? Now, I urge everybody to vote against this. If uh, Councillor Abiad uh, had taken the, uh, uh, the opportunity previously, he could have included it. He did not. He was not obviously present at the workshop and he was obviously not uh, not thinking about it when the uh, the budget came through council. It is a substantial sum of money, four hundred thousand dollars, and the costs remain. Uh, I'd urge him if he wishes to do something to incentivise operators of outdoor dining facilities in Adelaide to have a think about how we might do something to in incentivise them to do more than they are currently doing or to upgrade what they're doing. But. Cash handouts are, in, in my view, um, just a profligate waste. I've got Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Moran, and Councillor Malani. Uh, yes, it's my, in my view, it's a um, it's it's a cash handout that would just be absorbed um, by landlords who already, I'm advised, already 
take into account how much rent they charge a business because often rent's based on, on, on the sort of turnover or what the, what the market will bear, how much the tenant can afford to pay in rent. Some businesses have met as many seats outside as they do inside. Inside, they'd be paying a minimum of $220 a square metre per, um, uh, and up to four, $450, $500 a square metre, depending on where they're located. Yet, wherever we are in the city, our current charge is just $22 a square metre. Yet, they're making just as much money from their tables and chairs outside, where we're only charging $22 a square metre. It's like a tenth of the lowest possible rent already. It's already a 90% discount off the, off the cheapest possible thing. And you might say, well, there's because they, um, uh, it's outdoor dining and they might lose a sort of booking. But when the thing's completely replaced in plastic blinds with heaters and stuff like that, you need never lose a booking. And I think what's really happening is that landlords are just pumping up the rent because there's more tables and chairs, completely internalised public realm. You go down Lundell Street with the plastic blinds, just completely lining the street, looks terrible. And and this motion, I think, is, is um, in my view, uh, irresponsible and reckless um, and to be could put without notice, without an opportunity of the council uh, administration to report on something with over 400,000 on implication, I think is ridiculous. And, um, but um, the, uh, uh, it's, you know, in my view, it's obviously would gain favour with people who would get the benefit, but ultimately those people who would get that benefit would ultimately <coughs> probably just get the rent go up. So what they're not paying to the ratepayers, they're then just paying to their landlords because that's already happening because we have such cheap outdoor dining that there's nowhere near um, commercial rates now and all of that means their landlords are basically um, taking up the slack and getting the benefit of our largesse. So um, this would be largesse in the extreme and I'd urge members not to support this. And if you think about the incentive, no one's not putting out outdoor dining at $22 a square metre. It's a no-brainer for a cafe or restaurant operator to, to, op to take an opportunity of something that's a tenth of the lowest possible rent already. So, you know, then just give, giving it away for nothing. Um, with, with no incentives to get rid of plastic blinds or go to removable furniture or, you know, any, any enhancements like that, um, just achieves nothing. Councillor Moran? Yes, look, on, on two, two um, prongs, I won't support this. I mean, it is public land. You should pay something for it. You're earning privately money for that. We don't get any more, uh, we don't get a great rate increase. Um, and it, I think the main thing is, if there was a screaming need, people saying, look, I've got this fabulously white footpath, I can't do it, I can't afford your fees. Now, I door knocked down the, the East End and I haven't heard that. I've heard lots of other things like, uh, like David would have done up parks in front of my, you know, I want uh, my footpath widened, so I can put them out. But I have never once heard somebody say, I'd love to put 20 tables out there, council will let me, but I just can't afford it. So it's I'm solving a problem that in my mind does not exist. Uh, public land is there for the foot traffic, but we also love our outdoor dining. Um, when Jan Gill came to us, um, he pointed out that Copenhagen makes quite a lot from registering um, tables and chairs out of the footpath. So we'd be, we'd be foolishly um, throwing money at it. But I think the most important thing, is, apart from the fact there's no problem, is that it is such a blunt instrument. I mean, we've tinkered with it about smoking. You get a bit of a reduction um, if you have a non-smoking area. So we've used it as a tool to change the behaviour of the outdoor dining. Some didn't take it up and some did. If we give it free, we have no skin in the game anymore. Um, it's just their land, they'll take it over. They're already a bit bullshit about it, some, some um, businesses. Um, but we could have, I would totally support incentives like to replace the ubiquitous plastic blinds with something better. We might give them a rate free period. Um, smoking, I think we should still keep as, a, as an incentive and lower their rates for that. Um, remove their um, bolted on tables from the past. We could give them an incentive to replace them with better furniture. But this is just handing money to businesses that are already quite happily, in my mind, paying for it already. But I think the important thing is, having sat through the excruciatingly 
long and boring meetings, often with barely court, often not court at all. It really irks me. I didn't vote for the budget because I didn't like the 1% rate rise. Um, so to say now this isn't a council vote, yes it is. Every single, when you vote for the budget, you're voting for every single thing on it. If you want to change, pull one out and amend it, you do so at the budget meeting. If you don't think it's important enough to do it at the budget meeting, you ride with it, say, well, we'll sort it out when it comes back from consultation. But to do it in this manner is wrong. Um, I would suggest that the councillor wait till the consultation comes back and go out like a good ward councillor or knock on the business's doors and say, contact council if you think that the rates are too high. I'm going out and spending a lot of time putting in rate free vote for a rate freeze because we're $30 million in over underspent anyway with two weeks to go. We don't need your 1%. I'm getting out there and doing that. So I suggest that rather than this, um, pinning our hand behind our back and saying do this and then look, getting like looking like we're not supporting outdoor dining, which of course everybody is, that the council go out into his electorate and see if there's a real need for it and ask those people to fill in the forms and, and um, answer the consultation. This is not the way to do it, as it wasn't the way to do it with the previous motion. We had our vote, you had your chance, now we're out to, to consultation. You have another chance when it comes back from that, but not in between. It's very bad practice for councillors to be putting the hand in the public in the council purse now in this period where the convention is that we have voted on the budget, it goes out to the draft, then we have another look at it on consultation. To come in in this week is, is very, very bad practice. Um, Anyway, that's, that's what I'll be doing right against it. Councillor Maloney. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just, you know, when you speak to small hospitality businesses, and I can give you names of them on O'Connell Street, Gawler Place, etc., that do find the outdoor dining fees incredibly tough and impactful on their business. So in this context, I'm actually very keen to try this. Um, for a year. You know, we, we didn't think that Adelaide Oval, there was people that said that's not going to make a big difference on our city, but it's turned out to be a massive catalyst for change. I'm actually interested to see whether removing outdoor dining fees will be a massive catalyst for change on the streets of our city in terms of encouraging the um, small business to open up and, and utilise um, uh, the streets for outdoor dining. If we get it wrong, we get it wrong, but at least we're bold decision makers and we give something a go. Um, I and I would be and, and, and let's measure it and be, you know, proactive about how we actually see the growth in this in this area. Because ultimately they thrive, we get more rates back in our pocket. Um, and that's new new revenue. Um, the and I do think if we can get this out now, uh, we can put it in part of the consultation. I think consultation is important. Um, I, I am of the view now of shifting my position. The, the budget is out for consultation. We're getting feedback. And, and if we're going to uh, not make any change from the budget, then I, I, my position has changed on, on around the, the rate freeze. So you're telling me that I can't change my mind. We, we are came, we are we are able to change our mind. When it comes to and I share um, here. Um, so so for me, I think let's be bold. Let's give this a go. We we've always intended to do it. It got missed in the budget process. We're clar oh, clar yeah. giving clarity in I our. It did not get. Missed. It got missed, it got missed in, by in, Sam in, and Natasha. It well, did get missed. around to people who bothered to turn around their workshops. And you had your opportunity. It, uh, and I think um, I'm, I'm very keen for us to trial this 16-17 mm -hmm. budget period. So let's give it a go. Uh, let's monitor it. And uh, like I said, if it doesn't work, we can we can um, change it. But uh, and and look for other incentives, as Councillor Moran said. But I'm after speaking to small business. I think there's a really good opportunity and a catalyst here. Councillor Antic, Councillor Vershaw after that. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Look, I'll be supporting this as well. I, I supported the original um, proposition and I, and I still support it. And I think Councillor Lane is quite right. I mean, this is a trial. We do need to be a little bit bold and try something different. Um, 
this is something that will make a difference to to the ratepayers and the small businesses around town. That it, it, it just will. I mean, um, I'm not a central ward councillor, but there are businesses in in the south ward who would who would I'm sure be uh, over the moon for a little bit of help. Uh, they are tough economic times, as we've said many many times over, and uh, I don't think there is any harm in um, in uh, giving them an opportunity to. Um, uh, perhaps uh, explore a, a new area in, in outdoor dining. It might just do exactly what we've, we've thought and uh, and provide a little bit of extra vibrancy, there's that word, uh, to the city, which uh, hopefully that one's on the way out. But um, the word, not the concept. Um, but um, we need to find a new one. But in any event, um, uh, the whole point is that uh, I think I think it's quite reasonable and uh, I supported it initially and I'll support it again. Uh, and I ask uh, others will too. Councillor Virtual. Um, thank you. Could I just ask the administration, when, when um, we, uh, a few years ago, when, as part of the Splash Project, you did the Splash Outdoor Dining, there were no fees attached to that? <coughs> I know, it's just I think we tripled the outdoor dining over that period of time. I don't believe there were fees attached. I, I, don't, I don't agree with taking 400000 out of the budget. I do agree with putting an incentive in for new businesses to trial outdoor dining. So I would be very much in favour of giving a 12-month um, fee-free zone to any businesses that want to try outdoor dining with a view that they then pay fees as per the fee schedule after that. Um, so I don't actually know what the council decision was. Um, I was here for the discussion on the budget and I believe we actually specifically talked about that item in the budget and uh, that those that were here decided that we would leave it in the budget. So, um, so unless anybody can tell me what the actual council decision was. Yeah, we do actually have some notes of that. Um, so uh, this comes from... Hmm. Budget session where administration notes council's intention to remove outdoor dining fees based on council policy. Does someone else want to talk to us? Yeah, yeah. 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 So through the chair, the original um, motion um, endorsed by council towards the end of last year, it was either November or December, reads, administration notes council's intention to remove outdoor dining fees based on council policy. The outdoor dining policy is returned to council for consideration with this new position in mind. The 2016-17 budget process considered this intent. I'll consider. Okay. We did that. We ruled it out. Okay, Councillor Vershaw, did you have anything else you wanted to say? So, Councillor Clarehan, did you wish to speak? Look, I, I think this policy is a very blunt tool. I agree with the comments made previously. Our fees are so low anyway. If they've never been a disincentive for anyone wishing to occupy the footpaths for outdoor dining. However, we do provide other services. For example, street cleaning. Now, at what point do we actually say that people making a lot of money out of outdoor dining make a contribution to the costs of actually maintaining those footpaths? Let me tell you, the residents aren't getting too many footpaths swept or weeded, and it's like a, it's like a black hole. I agree with incentivising. I think the suggestions made tonight are fine. I disagree with making these sorts of decisions on motions without notice. We've talked about it earlier. This is another example. As has been mentioned, it should come back later. This is a half, nearly a half a million dollar decision. And yet there are people screaming for undergrounding of power lines, fixing up footpaths so residents aren't tripping over at night, improved lighting. What is going on? This is publicly owned land. We do not charge very much at all for our outdoor dining fees. It's never stopped anyone from putting tables and chairs outside. This is just a blunt tool and a totally unnecessary one. And we just don't have that much money to splash around. Councillor Slammer. Chair, I recall distinctly at the um, finance 
budgeting meeting today. Um, I supported the zone on this um, early days, and I still do. Um, but I remember um, at the budgeting meeting, I think it was a 50-50 split, and, and I put my hand up to to move that we we don't do it and keep the money. We had the same conversation um, at that time, time for the third time, and for the sake of doing the same thing again, I'm just gonna I can't support it. Councillor Corbell. I'm speaking in support of it. Um, I did support it at Council um, when it came up last year, I think it was in December, and um, I don't recall the budget discussion. I know that I did miss a couple of meetings, I was away, and um, I don't recall us addressing this. Um, I will support it. I think it's um, an interesting way to cut businesses that do have outdoor um, dining, give them a bit of a break, and also a bit of an opportunity for other businesses that might have considered it before in the past, um, but there's been the barrier there of the cost um, for them to try something something new. We don't know, we haven't done this before, so we don't know what impact it's going to have. This is a chance for us to try something different. Let's see what happens. I'm keen for Adelaide to become more dynamic. I like what I see in other cities where, and you know, the European style of fresco dining. I'd like to see more, more of that in the city, and I'm keen to support this. Oh, <laughs> Chair, I've got a uh, question either through to the move or through to administration who may be an answer. But the debate that we had last year was that uh, with regards to waiving these period, these fees for a finite period of 12 months as a trial. Was that my understanding of that uh, movement? Uh, Lord Mayor, there wasn't a defined time on it, but that is open for consideration. I'll speak to this. Um, it's pretty tough in small business at the moment. It's pretty tough. There's been a proliferation of uh, 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 hospitality operators throughout the city of Adelaide. There's now some 60 small licensed venues that have opened up in the last three years alone. There are any more cafes, uh, restaurants, uh, you name it. And as we know, members, it's, uh, they're feeling a bit of pain. Uh, not as a consequence of doing things, not as a consequence of not innovating, not as a consequence of not putting out a good offer to the general public, just sheerly as a confidence of the sheer weight of competition in the marketplace. So um, I support this on the grounds that it's going to give them a break. Uh, but I do support this on a finite time limit attached to it. I support this on if there could be any incentives married into the offer too. But in principle, I do support it. Like small businesses are doing it darn tough. Uh, there's no doubt about that. We all hear that, members. Um, but I mean, small business are the backbone of the city of Adelaide. So I'm taking a little bit of what some of the members have said in terms of can there be an incentive married into this and can there be a fine, finite timeline put on it. Uh, I'll put that back to Councillor Abbiano when he sums up. Which I think um, you will do now, Councillor Abbiano, unless anybody else wishes to speak. We've run out of speakers. Right, back to you, Councillor Abbiano. Thank you, Councillor, and thank you, members, for considering this again. Look, I don't know how many of you around the room have operated a hospitality business. I have for 10 years, and I'm in regular contact with hospitality businesses. Some of them are paying upwards of $5,000 a year for fees. And if any of you think this is small money, it's not. This is about also an incentive back for Council. It's about owning that space. Councillor Wilkinson talks about plastic blinds outside. We talk about the Alfonso tent on Hutt Street covering a beautifully uh, beautiful heritage building. There's a whole heap of things that are happening at the moment in the city and outdoor dining that we have no control over. This is an opportunity for us to say to people and to our hospitality businesses in the city of Adelaide, that look, we're prepared to cut your slack here. We're prepared to invest in your business for you to deliver vibrancy to our city. We keep talking about having people out there in the outdoor dining area, more involved, more engaged, and having businesses open in the city and bring change about. With that, we can come in with a policy change and say to them, look, you're not paying for the space. We expect not to see blinds. We don't wanna see permanent tables and chairs. If you're gonna put permanent tables and chairs, we will charge you. If you're gonna put a blind, we will charge you. If you're gonna erect a tent uh, on top of the footpath, we will charge you. However, if you do everything in accordance to the guideline, very clearly they will not be charged because you are investing in the city of Adelaide, you are investing in vibrancy, you are bringing people to the city of Adelaide and we value every single one of these people. But not just the to stop order. there. That's not what the motion said. That's not just to stop the there. That's just not to stop there. It's all different. Councillor Moran. No, no, the point of 
order. That is not the motion. He's supposed to be summing up. He's now brought in new information. That's not new information, sorry, Chair. Not I'm sorry. Councillor Moran. If Councillor Moran feels that she's losing the debate, this is not fair for her to bring this about that way. I'm talking directly to the motion and the incentives at which when we don't charge for a space, what we can do with the space, because we practically own it. We can invoke policy, we can cut back red tape, we can cut back red space, a red tape, and we can control a lot of those measures. Chair, can I get, please, a few minutes of silence just to make that point? Councillor Moran. Councillor Abbey, I'm sorry. 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 Consider outdoor and doing it. out to consultation, Chair. Councillor Moran. Moran. Are we considering it? Councillor Moran. Oh, I guess let's change the wording. Let's have removed. That is not, he's not Councillor Abbiard. Summing up is to sum up on the council. Councillor Abbiard, to, to sum up. And I've, I've taken advice from our secretary, Councillor Moran, and Councillor Abbiard is entitled to sum up in the way he's summing up. Can you please give him the opportunity to do that? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not committing council to $400,000 here. I am committing council to consider this as part of its budget process to see if we can fund it. That's what I'm doing. I'm not committing uh, $400,000 today to be committed. It's part of the budget consideration uh, once the budget comes back. Let me remind members, businesses in the city of Adelaide contribute more than 80% of our rates. 80% of the rates from the city of Adelaide comes into this council from the business community. Uh, residents have got uh, residential rebates that kick into their rates on a whole. We don't have residential rate rebates. Exactly right. so we used to. We used to. Ten years ago, we did. <laughs> no, well, so so <laughs> Thank you, Chair. We are providing here an incentive to businesses in the city of Adelaide and hospitality. We are saving them money. We're encouraging them to activate outdoor space, which is important for our city vibrancy. They are doing it very tough. Hospitality is in demand. Have a look around you. There used to be one snack bar in a 1K radius. Now we're talking cafe after cafe after cafe after cafe. Retail's taken a hit. People are doing more hospitality than they're doing everything else. I haven't seen our residential population pick up. I haven't seen that. There are more cafes per capita now than we've ever had before. There is definitely a challenge there for those businesses and those businesses need to be supported. One of the things that I don't get, <coughs> this council is prepared to do more for a mobile food vending program than it is for its own hospitality businesses in the city of Adelaide. It is cheaper for someone to have a mobile food vending permit than it is for them to have an outdoor dining permit. Imagine that. Imagine that. That's that's how it is. Okay, that's literally how it is. Councillor Moran, that motion. Councillor Moran, I'll look please please fact in stop here. interjecting. I cannout hear. Listen to Councillor Moran. Rewrite Could you please? I'm, I'm requesting that you stop interjecting. I have uh, Chair, seriously, I just need to. Carry on. Thank you. This is an economic contributor for our city. It will support our small businesses in the city. It doesn't just stop and start here. There is more that we could do with this and support those businesses. And if it means to some councillors that I need to go out there right now over the next couple of weeks and get more than a thousand people to support this in our community and signatory, I will do that. I will bring them here to the budget meeting. I will have this whole gallery packed with hospitality businesses that will tell you they're doing it tough when every single councillor here that opposed this chair have said to me, they're not doing it tough. It's cheap for them. They didn't bring it up. That, that is not the facts. The facts are very clear that they are doing it tough. It is not easy for them. And I will make sure that this, through this consultation process, I will bring every hospitality business in the city of Adelaide that is doing it tough into this room to debate the budget and to provide that cut. If you're not willing to listen from me, which I happen to be one community representative, just one, 
that maybe you are prepared to listen for the community when they come here and they ask you for that cutback. And Councillor Wilkinson, you can shake your head all that you want. All that you want. All that you want. All of you can shake your heads if you need to cast them around. But ultimately, this is a matter, like I said, that I'd like for it to be considered part of the budget. If not, and council would want to see this in, in the last and final bit of budget consideration, then that's fine. We'll consult with the community, we'll bring the signatures back into here, we'll bring the community back into this chamber, and they can assist us in making that decision. Thank you, Councillor Abbott. Right, time to vote. Can I ask that you make it very clear, which of, because I think we're going to be right down the line on this one. So all those in favour? <coughs> all those against? Can we do it again for all those in favour? Oh, sorry, that's what I was going on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Five in favour at the moment. Okay. All those against? That's lost. Seven, sorry. That's lost. Okay. Um, councillors, that brings us, I think, unless somebody else has any other business. Councillor Corbell. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, something a bit lighter to finish off on. I've circulated a motion without notice. Um, in regards to acknowledging um, and welcoming our sister city residents through some signage. I believe that. Has that been circulated? Um, Councillor Corbell, I'm not 100% sure that has been circulated. The last I saw that was with um, uh, Donna and it was to be passed on to, uh, to Judy, but we haven't received it. Okay. okay, all right. Well, um, perhaps we could do it. Do you think we can do that? Do we do that at the I could do it at council. council. If it hasn't been seen, then I think some commentary can be provided. Okay. I'll put it on notice. Yes, it will become my motion without notice that I was intending on bringing up tonight um, will actually be better with a bit of contextual information. I'm happy to bring it to council as a right, motion. Thank you, Councillor Cobell. Apologise for that. I thought that was under control. It may well be on notice next week, perhaps. Okay. Um, we um, now have a, a um, confidential workshop. Um, so I need someone to move the exclusion, please. Moved by Councillor Cobell, seconded by Councillor Vershaw. All those in favour of the exclusion? That's carried. So all members of the public and, and members of staff who are not involved in this item, agenda item, could you please um, leave the chamber? We'll, for your information, we should be 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll be reopening the meeting. <coughs>
People, the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural uh, heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we acknowledge our continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. Uh, apologies and leave of absence. I believe Councillor Vershaw is an apology. Um, confirmation of the minutes. Can I have someone please move? Deputy Lord Mayor Hender, seconded by Councillor Milani. I'll put that. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. We don't have uh, any public forums. Uh, I, will, um, I don't have a chair's verbal report either. And I'll move to item six uh, items for adoption on block. We have a presentation in item seven, but we'll get to that in a minute. Item eight procurement of goods and services of South Australian based organisation and measuring economic contribution. Item nine 15 16 quarter three revised forecast. Councillor Martin. Item uh, 10 to receive a note, end of quarter three, 15, 16 integrated business plan. And out of session, information papers to note, notification regarding alteration of on street parking controls. Can I have someone move those items with the exception of item nine? Moved by Deputy Lord Mayor Hender, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Any debate? I put that. All those in favour? All those against, those, those, those items are carried. Uh, we will park item nine for the time being and we will move to presentation, the Adelaide Central Market Capital Works Program. I'd like to invite um, Mr. Nick. Yep, sorry, Dr. Lubin, you had your hand up. Um, once you've invited, I, I need to declare a conflict of interest. Not a problem, that's fine. I'll invite him to the chair and, and happy to take that on board. Um, so just would like to invite uh, Mr Nick Bagakis, the chair of the Adelaide Central uh, Market Authority and also Mr Aaron Rubby, the general manager for the Adelaide Central Market Authority. Councillor Hender. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. I've been advised by um, administration because of some changes in the legislation that uh, any time a matter that relates to a, a, this authority of a board on which I sit uh, comes before council, I now have to remove myself. I'm just pointing out to the other uh, councillors, it's being described by our lawyers as an absurdity. <laughs> However, it's apparently a necessity. So on that basis, I remove myself. Can I just... No, I don't know. Just, just your mic, councillor. Yes, when we... Um, you might remember that... Um, you might not actually still remember. We challenged that when Mark Harbis, um, Mark Henningsen sued, took um, new law. It's a new, no, it's, it's a new no, that, the decision. Just coming. Councillors, just to provide, I'm happy to provide more well, information for you, Councillor Moran, but Councillor Hender, you're entitled to declare conflict yeah. and leave the room. But we need some report on that because that's that's gone back on what. Because it flipped that way after that, and then it went back. Happy to um, I mean, that just mean, that, that, to the CEO. Potentially, we could just take that on notice and provide some advice to council members in relation to that. Because that makes it absolutely useless to have anybody on, say, the motorsport board, any board at all, if they can't um, share that their experience on that. So, if uh, if that is the case, then I think we should pull all our councillors off board. It's a waste of time. Council Moran, thank you. We'll receive advice on that. Um, welcome, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present tonight. ACMA's high purpose is to make the Adelaide Central Market the best produce market in the world. From recent research that we have conducted, it appears that our Adelaide Central Market is the oldest extant produce market in this country, pipping the Queen Victoria markets by nine years. The Adelaide Central Market is the cornerstone of the market district. Without a vibrant and commercially viable Adelaide Central Market, the City Council and the State Government strategic plans for the southern part of the City of Adelaide are unlikely to be optimally realised. This was born out through the extensive market district reference group consultations which produced the market district uh, plan. In the time that I've been Chair of uh, ACMA, I've come to realise just uh, how connected every, and I mean every, South Australian is to the Adelaide Central Market. Everyone, it seems, has a personal connection and prepared to share their comments, which I take as feedback uh, with me. Uh, just this morning I was, I know it's not the market, but I was at Chianti, and um, um, Anne Oliver, the chef, came up and gave me a hug and said, what a great job uh, we were doing at the market. The Adelaide Central Market is an ancient market in global terms. Ancient markets, by their very nature, require significant and ongoing costs in maintaining a commercially acceptable environment. If it were a normal shopping centre, much like the Central Market Arcade, we would build it, run it, run it down, knock it down and start again. Not the case here. ACMA directors, management and staff have spent significant time in considering the future proofing of the Adelaide Central Market and tonight's presentation is a culmination of this work. This work has been conducted in close liaison with the Adelaide City Council administration. ACMA sees this program and budget as important, particularly given the Adelaide Central Market Arcade redevelopment, something that will be a pause before we know it. This is the largest capital renewal investment in the Adelaide Central Market since 1986, other than the installation of additional fire services and the Guja Street Lift. Our 90 leaseholders are watching with anticipation. ACMA directors have a duty of care. This extends beyond just the asset renewal, which is the subject of tonight's presentation. Tonight's presentation takes into account ACMA Director's fiduciary duties. Tonight's presentation has, of course, been endorsed by the ACMA Board. I commend our proposed 2016-17 Capital Works Program and Budget to you. And now I'd like to hand over to our General Manager, Aaron Brumby, to take us through the details.
Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, firstly, I'd just like to um, provide a little bit of information before I start the slide presentation we have. Um, firstly, I'd like to say I've now been in the role 14 months um, as general manager of the Adelaide Central Market. I'd like to share with you guys some of my observations and, uh, and findings to provide a bit of context to tonight's briefing on the Capital Works program for next financial year. Uh, firstly, we have a wonderful group of passionate traders with a diverse range of commercial challenges, including margin squeeze, continuous growth in competition, including more than a billion dollars worth of investment in retail in the suburbs, and the diversification challenges. However, they are now highly supportive of the commercial outcomes and the customer-centric focus that ACMA is placing on the market to drive prosperity in the traders. Secondly, we have a strong established working relationship now with traders. In the past 12 months, we've issued more than 100 newsletters to the traders and had six after-hours briefing sessions. So the traders receive a piece of written confirmation or material from us every four days. Uh, we have a team of staff in the ACMA office who are dedicated to improving the prosperity of the market. They live and breathe the vision to be the best produce market in the world and strive for excellence in all that we do. However, operationally, we face a number of ch challenges. We require significant capital renewal as the historical investment has been less than optimal for a variety of possible reasons. I have prepared a capital expenditure program for 2016-17 that's focused on asset renewal that will ensure we continue to have a compliant, well-serviced, professional retail environment. As an example of an asset uh, renewal issue that we've had in the market recently, in late November last year, we had a blockage in the main sewer waste connection pipe uh, for the market leading into Gooja Street. To rectify the issue, the sewer blockage, or to rectify the sewer blockage, we excavated a large hole more than 15 feet deep into part of the market. Uh, to unearth the pipe, the old copper pipe, when we excavated down to the right point, we discovered the pipe was no longer in existence and disintegrated. In SA Water's opinion, the pipe was between 80 to 100 years old. <coughs> That's just to provide a bit of context around how we've come up with our proposal for the next financial year. Uh, so on the first slide, as we can see, we have 21 projects planned within the market uh, complex itself, two projects in the market car park at a uh, estimated cost of proposed works of 3.77 million. Once again, similar to this financial year, we're focusing on risk management, best practice retail and sustainability. Now in coming up with a list of projects, we had a look at a ratings process to work out what were the high and medium rated projects. Uh, high rated projects uh, have a high risk uh, that they may result in a costly loss of asset or diminished commercial results for traders, risks of impact on operations or risks that elevate the likelihood of significant impact to customers' experience or compliance within the Australian Standard and Building Code. Medium rated objects had an impact risk that may result in costly loss of assets or minor changes to commercial results for traders, impede operations or risks that cause less than optimal customer experience or increase the likelihood of non-compliance. Uh, when we ran that lens over the actual uh, Capital Works program, um, we found that 96% sat within the high priority rating. Um, and we have a list of uh, the top 10 items on the right by value. Um, the works I'll run through in a bit more detail shortly. And 4% of the projects uh, within the market complex and car parks sat within the medium category. The low category we've just left out altogether for this uh, for our, uh, our uh, proposed capital works program. Thank you. Um, of the projects that we're putting forward, uh, 10 in total sit perfectly with uh, Council's draft strategic plan. We have five, five items in the green area four items in smart and one in the livable um, city. Of the high priority projects, uh, there's 17 in total. I'll probably just touch on the top 10. Um, we have a main electrical switch room repairs, roof repairs and federal hall repairs, Gujar and Great Street facade repairs, fire services renewal, electrical infrastructure renewal, telecoms renewal, sewer system renewal, vacant store fit out works and store renewal works. 
So within that top top 10, you can see that they're without doubt, we are suggesting that there is a lot of um, cost requirement towards renewal activities. Within the medium priorities, we had an escalated landing area upgrade, IT upgrade fund and a PA system installation. We've also included in our capital works program the uh, installation of the right hand, uh, right hand turn off of Grote Street into the market car park. Uh, we have worked closely uh, with administration around this over the past 12 months. Uh, the modelling has been completed for the traffic management, the uh, preliminary designs be completed. There's an opportunity to move now into detailed design and then delivery of the project. Uh, we have uh, uh, put together an estimated cost of $300,000 um, to deliver that outcome. The area in red in the right hand image is roughly where the uh, right hand turn will be positioned. So the Adelaide Central Market has, as I said, 21 projects in the complex, two projects in the market car park, an estimated cost of $3.77 million, including the $300,000 right hand turn. Just a final slide um, on some governance considerations. The ACMA Charter requires uh, council approval of ACMA's proposed business plan and budget, including the Capital Works Program. ACMA's Capital Enhancement Fund contains insufficient resources to undertake the proposed 2016-17 Capital Works. The ACMA Charter permits ACMA to borrow money for capital enhancements in the event there are insufficient funds in the Capital Enhancement Fund. Borrowings are not permitted for capital renewal unless otherwise approved by council. Five, the central market building assets are owned by Adelaide City Council as landlord, ACMA as tenant. ACMA management is working with Adelaide City Council management to finalise an appropriate funding model for consideration by council in June of this year. So today's briefing is to provide some information on the projects that we're putting forward and the funding will come back through in June. Thank you very much. Um, does that conclude your presentation? Unless <coughs> we're quite prepared to take, take some questions. Excellent. So, <laughs> Councillor Martin and Councillor Wilson. Um, thank you for that. Um, I guess the question that's uppermost in my mind is given that this council has already agreed that the central uh, market arcade will be redeveloped in 2019, are any of these measures? likely to be disturbed by that redevelopment that scheduled for 2019, including the right-hand turn, because I would have thought that area is going to be substantially affected. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, uh, we won't be spending any money that will then disappear. The right-hand turn is um, uh, necessary so that the western side of Adelaide can get used to the fact that now, um, that when that's done, that they're able to come in uh, to the market um, and do a right hand turn and get in. Uh, when uh, that was on that uh, about 10 years ago, um, the market lost that. The anecdotal evidence we have from the, from the traders, not only in the central market, but in the arcade and in the plaza, is the trade dropped anywhere up to 30%. Um, it, by the time we get to finish this, um, and remembering that it's up at the um, east, uh, it, sorry, it's at the western end of the uh, of the buildings, and therefore um, uh, it won't uh, be anywhere near where the um, uh, redevelopment uh, with it will actually occur. That um, uh, by the time we get it finished, it will be sometime in 2017. All right, right there. That's great. So uh, when uh, when you look at the timelines for any uh, redevelopment, uh, for us to be able to get uh, behavioural changes in our uh, customers, um, we're going to need that uh, that sort of time to be able to um, to use that phrase future proof uh, the market so that we can get a whole lot of um, um, additional customers uh, uh, to come in. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why that right hand turn into the Great Street entrance was, was closed 10 years ago, but I know that the council's own car park on the other side has got a thing you can turn right into that car park. It seems crazy that 
that one was closed, but the council had its own cut back over there, allowing the right hand turn. Councillor Wilkinson, but questions, please. If you'll allow me, please. No, I will not allow you questions. Um, That's exactly what we're doing right now. The, uh, without your interruption, please. The, um, uh, what I'm getting to see, the $300,000 cost seems extraordinary you know, for removing a bit of median strip. And have, have you explored options of sequencing the lights um, the intersection's only sort of 50 metres away, such that there's a change of that signalling that would enable cars to turn in there or even be permitted to do U turns so that well, that could be done more economically than 300,000. Through you, Chair. Uh, first of all, the 300,000 is inclusive of said works in regards to signalling and uh, traffic uh, calming or allowing the traffic to actually flow into the car park and also uh, part of the works in regards to the design is also to look at what uh, hasn't been said today is to look at the not only the right time to turn but how you align it with the ramps actually going into the car park so there's a lot of work actually involved in regards to it's not as easy as just removing the median and allowing the right hand turn we also need to understand the impacts of that right hand turn uh, in regards to traffic flow and also we need to look at the sequencing uh, of the traffic lights going out out uh, bound in regards to allowing that right hand turn to, to actually take place as well so there's a lot of works actually associated with traffic lights the ramps and the right hand turn and looking at the impact plus the 300,000. Thank you Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Mulani then Councillor Kieran. Thank you. Just quickly, um, fire services renewal, because um, we did a fair bit of work on that in recent, um, recently. Can you just, what, just, is that obviously different works and important works, but just give me what's the difference? Yeah, the uh, additional works that we're proposing as part of fire services renewal is to, uh, I'd say, fill a few gaps that we have where stalls have changed design over the years and um, the, those gaps in the system. Um, we need to uh, resolve and, and close and the fire services renewal that we're putting forward will allow us to do that. And can you tell me um, the the second story that we talk, we've talked about before, can you just give an indication where some of that consideration is at? Second. Or the um, tap tower, whatever, the, the, uh, the upstairs section that's not. We're just on Grove Street. Mm. Yeah, there's really two parts uh, in answer to that question. Firstly, the market tower. Mm. Um, we're continuing work on the engineering design to understand how we could reuse that space. Um, the, in, the installation of the giant Father Christmas in December last year allowed us to get a much better understanding of the actual structural build of the tower. Um, so we're now progressing uh, on that project to see how we can use the space. I'd say there's still probably another six to 12 months of time to, to resolve all the issues that exist there for us to make it habitable. Or occupiable, um, and then secondly, in relation to the the first floor of um, uh, the federal hall, um, there is a, a project manager administration looking at opportunities of how that can be better used um, in consultation with ACMA. We both have extreme opportunity, and just quickly, just a comment more than anything, picking up on what Councillor Martin said, uh, particularly around waste waste management and and anything that's that hard service related. Because when we do look at the um, market arcade upgrade, I'm, I'm just hoping that they, that that connectivity, you know, because a lot of that could be, you know, whether it's delivery and service and and waste, all you know, shuffled underground potentially. Um, I just want that. I don't want that to be overlapped. I'll just make that as a comment. Well, um, thank you for the comment. Uh, uh, we will be cognizant of uh, of those uh, matters. Um, we will, however, um, in terms of delivery, um, we actually don't want to hide the deliveries. Part of, part of the charm of the market um, is actually having the deliveries on the street. And uh, if we were to put it under, if we were to put it underground, if we were to put it underground, it'd be like a supermarket. But it's just a big fan, deadly bit anyway, isn't it? It's, it's a big, big what, sorry? It's just one huge big truck. Now it's not like little wooden truck coming. I've seen it there, it's horrible. Oh, well, um, uh, they are, uh, there are some medium-sized trucks. Um, it's the big trucks are the ones that are coals. Uh, the medium-sized trucks uh, uh, disgorge uh, pallets worth of uh, product 
and put them on the footpath. And it's those that are moved around either by forklift or by hand truck, which um, give, give the I've place. I've seen that as when we used to run market. Um, and I don't think that, in my personal opinion, that isn't an attractive look. They're just commercial trucks all coming from the port. There's mm. nothing personal about them. It's not a, in the old days, like the East End, it was a farmer who brought it in. They clogged up the streets. So, so I'd really ask you to reconsider that. If, if that is a, I think it's lost the magic of the old farmer's trucks coming in. It's better put downstairs, not wasting our valuable curbside spots. Well, I, I think thank I'm, I'm great. Councilor, I'm, I'm losing a bit of it. Um, so thank you for your comments, Fess. Give Nick the opportunity to reply. Are you satisfied with the reply there, Councilor Malani? Well, I just think that it's very incredibly important that those two, inter well, as much we can put underground, I think we need to look at. Yep. And we categorically, whilst I don't know remotely what the Central Market Arcade upgrade is going to look like, redevelopment, my gut instinct tells me that there's a great opportunity to put a lot of that stuff out of sight. So uh, I, I do think that. Agreed. Councillor Ferrari. Thank you. Again, thanks for all the amazing work that you're doing there. Um, I just wanted to ask about the turn right. And given that there is a council owned car park on the other side of the, of the street, have we registered, have you monitored or has council monitored the occupancy rate of that car park during busy market times? Uh, yes, you park closely monitor the um, the number of vehicles in that car park as a comparison to the market and it, it regularly gets discussed in meetings that I have with you park. And is it often full? Uh, no. No. So, are you, would you be robbing Peter to pay Paul by putting the right turn in? We want it. I, I don't think yeah, I don't think so in that it's a different uh, customer and tariff rate and uh, type of parker that uses the bus station car park so they offer opportunities like early bird parking all day rates that that type of um, customer experience where whereas our car park is all about short turnover retail facilitating the retail environment we have so I think the customers that park in the two are actually quite a different customer I, I just wanted to well, I use that car park on a Saturday morning when I go to the market and it's very busy um, and people like it because it's actually got much more space to load and unload etc uh, and it's convenient because it's accessible from the, from the west. So I just am mindful of the fact that whilst I acknowledge your desire to have better access into the market. It could be a matter of robbing Peter to pay Paul because I do know lots of people who go to the market on Saturday mornings do use that. So thank I you. think we just need to be mindful of that. No, sir, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ferran. Members, any other questions? Can I just ask um, our, st our administration who. Can you use your mic, please, Councillor Ferran? Who, who okayed the $300,000? I, I could totally agree with Sue. Uh, we, uh, North Adelaide comes from the West. And after a little initial sort of, oh, you know, how do we get into the other car park? We noticed that there was a big U park called the bus station. So we all happily park in there on market days and it's quite busy. And we get the revenue from that. So I'm not sure why we're paying $300,000 to siphon um, cars into your car park when they're, they're quite happily turning left into our car park. So I don't understand. The question is who okayed that expenditure and hasn't been okayed yet? Because I, I don't want to know. Through you presiding yeah, member, yeah, the yeah, request yeah. before you tonight is actually a request for funding. It has not been uh, approved or endorsed at uh, this request via ACMA. Um, so what you're seeing tonight is the first time that you've seen it. Right. This is a workshop though, there's no motion. That's correct. Is. There is no recommendation. It's purely a presentation by ACMA. To I think that has to be, I'm not saying definitely no, but I think that really has to be looked at because Everybody I know parks in the bus station car park to go to the market. It's an easy one, it's very, it's busy. Um, but you know, I think we really, it's a hard ask for, to put that right hand turn. And the reason we got rid of the right hand turn, if anybody remembers, is because it, well, it did clog up um, uh, Road Street badly. Um, and it, it, there, was, there was method in that madness at the time. So I need to be, get, and I agree with it at the time, it is a nuisance though from the West, and there was complaints. But uh, anecdotally, to quote traders saying anecdotally there, um, Trade was down 30%. I can assure you, as my manager at the time, it was not after a couple of weeks. So I think we need to deal with facts rather than what the traders say, which is, in my experience, two different things. 
<laughs> Thank you, councillors. Oh, Anything in summing up? Um, <laughs> just <clears throat> uh, given the uh, uh, the interest in car parks uh, that has been expressed here, um, and um, about our central market car park uh, trial that we've had, uh, uh, April figures are in. And Aaron, would you like to share those? Yes, yeah, so this is for the uh, incentive uh, we have in the car park now. So April results were a 20% increase in vehicle numbers in the car park with uh, a 0% zero, zero change of revenue. So revenue matched last year. Excellent. Thank you very much for your presentation um, and for your time. And uh, we look forward to the next one. Okay. Thank you. Councillors, um, if we could just have Councillor Hender called back in. Thank you. Um, Councillor Martin, you have the floor on item Eight, uh, item nine, sorry. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Look, I, um, um, I'm moving this, that it be, what is the motion that it's noted? Are you moving as recommended? Yep, as recommended. So, moved as recommended. Can I have a second, please? Councillor Moran, do you have the floor, Councillor? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, uh, all I wanted to say is that um, this is a, uh, a really good result, this uh, QF3 Council. result. Um, and, and I'm particularly pleased, as you would expect me to be, about the uh, result of the efficiency dividend. Uh, you recall last year that I was proposing that that be a, a compulsory dividend, for which nobody had any appetite, but ultimately we agreed on a best endeavours voluntary efficiency dividend. And I'm just delighted that it's actually returned more than what was proposed. That is. 3.5% uh, was the proposal. It's returned on the general operations budget that's up $3.7 million. And the best part of it is that uh, $700,000 of those savings, 0 0.7 of a million, are ongoing savings year after year, which is just a sensational result. And uh, uh, I'm even thinking maybe we should do it again. Oh, Joe. Oh, Joe. Um, uh, but the, uh, the other uh, outcome that's really good is the bottom line. Um, and um, uh, as you know, uh, we don't have long-term debt. We only have basically what's a you know, continuing overdraft. And uh, this year, the administration is anticipating that instead of our having a budgeted deficit of $16.3 million as budgeted in 2015-16, uh, there'll be a deficit of $6 million. Now, I don't want to be controversial about this because I'll pick a fight if I call it a surplus, but uh, it means uh, essentially that uh, the administration has not been able to spend $10 million, more than $10 million of the money that was allocated in uh, the budget. Um, uh, and in fact, some of that is savings, some of it is carry forwards. Uh, uh, 8.6 million of which have, uh, have already been approved. Um, and uh, uh, this uh, opens uh, for me um, the question of uh, rate increases. And um, at um, the risk of sounding like a broken record, um, I just think that this enforces or reinforces the argument that we should not be asking ratepayers for an extra million dollars, the 1% increase. Um, it, inevitably, they will say, well, if you couldn't spend the $10 million that you had the previous year, why should you have another million dollars? Um, uh, and that outcome, uh, hopefully, will flow from this. I am aware, and I note Councillor Mal Malani's uh, statement tonight, that she is now a... a Please, please correct me if I'm wrong, but Councillor Milani is a rate of the dollar freezer. Why do you even bother having this conversation? Pointless. Oh, well, I, I was just going to compliment you, but it's okay, I'll move on. Um, please don't. Could you <laughs> don't compliment you, okay. No. You, you said we brought Councillor Milani, please. Stand by the budget we've got. Councillor Milani. Councillor Milani. Councillor Martin, you still have the call, please. <laughs> Try to speak to the 15-16 quarter three revised budget. I am. I'm just saying what a wonderful outcome it is, Chair. Right? Um, and so um, uh, I uh, commend this uh, uh, to uh, councillors. It is an outstanding result uh, and uh, one that it pleases me to recommend.
Councillor Hender, welcome back. Just to give you um, synopsis, we've just moved and seconded item nine, moved by Councillor Martin, seconded by Councillor Moran. Uh, now, Councillor Moran is a seconder. Would you like to speak? Any other debate members or questions of administration in relation to Deputy Lord Yeah, not debate, because I just wanted to make a comment um, in relation to the carry forwards um, the, that are identified on page 24, um, schedule nine. Um, and just to say um, what, a, what a good result I think it is. I mean, there are um, a number of things that have to be carried forward for various reasons. Um, but the carry forward budget, um, the, the amount of money that's been carried forward this time, as I understand it, is very significantly less than the previous years. So we're actually getting better and better at this. And that's just about getting better and better at, at, at aligning our budget. It's always tricky getting things to happen within the, you know, the 12 month period of a financial year. But our, our processes are obviously improving and we're getting a better result as a consequence. And so I just wanted to um, congratulate the administration on that and the work they've been doing. I know it's been a focus and I think it's been good. Thank you, uh, Councillor and Deputy Lord Mayor Hender. Any other remarks or questions? If there's none, Councillor Martin, sum up. Summed up, thank you. Summed up, I put the motion to you. All those in favour? All those against, uh, is carried. Uh, members, we've covered item 10 and 11. Uh, any other business? Item 12. Clear that there is none. I'll move on to item 13. Exclusion to consider page 64, item 14, quarter three business operational report, 1516, March year to date. Can I have a, a mover to exclude? Moved by Councillor Antic, seconded by Deputy Lord Mayor Hender. Any debate? All those in favour? To exclude all those against, that item is carried. Um, I could just have any members of the public or administration that are not directly related to that item to please exit the room. And I declare the meeting closed at 8.26 p.m. Thank you, members. Well done. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome, Chair. Very good. Yes.